Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Beth Mulcahy, and I would like to welcome you to our Facebook Live today. And we're going to be discussing a plan for reopening HOAs and condos in Arizona um, in light of the developments that have occurred this week. Um, so I'd first just like to start out by uh, welcoming everybody to our uh, Facebook Live today. I believe this is our fifth Facebook Live since the COVID-19 pandemic started. And um, before COVID-19, we really were not doing a lot of Facebook Lives. So it's been something that's kind of new and it's taken us out of our comfort zone a little bit. But um, I feel like we've been providing a lot of necessary information to board members to help them get through this difficult time. Uh, so as we get started today, I'd first just like to do a shout out for our first responders, our doctors, our nurses, especially because um, it's Nurse Appreciation Month right now, and to our essential workers who are really helping run our cities um, and our, our country. Um, but I'd also like to do a special shout out for board members and managers right now, because let's face it, um, we are in unprecedented times and we're all just trying to do our best to make sure that we're doing the right thing for our communities and we're doing it under you know, really difficult circumstances because a lot of board members and managers are also parents and we're homeschooling our kids while we're trying to handle all these HOA issues and condo issues and make right decisions with all these new changes in state and federal laws. And so I'd just like to start out and say there's a special place in heaven right now for board members and property managers uh, as we try to navigate these difficult times. Um, but I'd also like to start out to say um, that I understand. Um, I also serve as a board member for my community. And I will say that the past eight weeks have been extremely stressful serving as a board member um, in my community, even with my background uh, representing associations. Um, and I, I think I'll be able to share some anecdotes here today um, that will be able to maybe make everybody feel a little bit better. Okay, let's start out with what's going on in Arizona. We've got a lot going on this week. Um, as some of you may know, we, we started preparing for the reopening of common areas in Arizona um, about two weeks ago because we started to see a loosening of um, different restrictions that our state had placed on businesses. And we knew that that was kind of a, a warning sign that um, you know our stay-at-home order was going to be likely coming to an end on um, May 15th. What we didn't know was on Tuesday this week that we were going to have, you know, just a, a major drop of a lot of different information that we would need to process regarding reopening our common areas and procedures to do that. And so while we, we all were talking about what's it going to look like to reopen our pool and our tennis courts and our gyms and our clubhouses, we didn't really know what our governor and what the Arizona Department of Health Services was going to put in place. So it was difficult for all of us to plan because we didn't know if there were gonna be any special requirements that we all needed to comply with. And so on Tuesday afternoon, when we received um, the information that Governor Ducey was going to be not extending the stay home order uh, after May 15th, and that we were entering a new phase, um, you know, a, whereby there was going to be definitely a loosening of restrictions. And then the Department of Health Services issued some guidelines for us regarding reopening pools and reopening gyms. We had a lot to process Tuesday night. Um, and so I just would like you to know that what we did as a firm is we read through all of the orders and we read through all of the information on the websites that was posted. And I actually pulled an all-nighter. Um, I haven't done that in a while. Um, but we really thought through how can we best help our boards and the managers that we work with to give them information on what these orders mean and what the recommendations from the Department of Health Services, you know, what we're required to do, what we, we must do, what we can do if we want choice. Um, and then we put out a, a very extensive cheat sheet yesterday um, which you can find on our website. Um, and that is a plan, a plan for reopening uh, HOA and condo common areas. 
And if you haven't seen it already, um, we will share it with you right now during um, this Facebook Live so you have it handy right in front of you. Um, but you also can find all of our cheat sheets, including this new cheat sheet that's COVID-19 um, related on reopening your common areas. Um, and our most recent other cheat sheet on operating virtual meetings successfully on our law firm's webpage at www.mulcahylawfirm.com. Um, and so let's, you know, let's just kind of go over what we know about the, the orders. So what does this mean for associations? Um, does this mean, and let me start out by saying that everybody had anxiety when they read the governor's orders and the Department of Health Services uh, recommendations, including myself. So please know that you are not alone on this. We understand, I understand as an attorney that represents associations and I understand as a board member myself, um, this is a confusing time. And our job here as your trusted advisor and legal counsel is to try to interpret it for you and to try to help you make the best possible decisions for your association. Okay, so first let's start out by saying that, you know, these are the, the, um, the orders from our governor, you know, the stay at home order that's expiring, um, and also the Department of Health Services guidelines. Um, you know, these seem to give us the green light to start reopening our common areas. Um, obviously, the Department of Health Services order said that Arizona pools and um, gyms could reopen on, you know, the 13th yesterday. But, you know, I think what a lot of our homeowners are hearing is they watch the news, you know, they're checking this out on the internet and they're hearing open, open these things up like now, like what's the holdup? Why are you not doing what the governor said, you know, you should be doing? And I think there's a, a really important distinction that we need to talk about here. And that is that we are a private, um, you know, nonprofit corporation. This isn't a state run pool. And so we have different, you know, responsibilities when, as we are running um, our associations and our pools are, you know, semi-private pools is typically how these things are characterized. And, um, you know, we have some different recommendations um, that we are going to be making to our clients of a semi-private pool located in a condo or a planned community um, than the state would. Why? because we have liability, right? The association could be sued if we make a bad decision and somebody ultimately is harmed based upon our, our bad decision or our decision, maybe we just, it was negligence. We, we didn't think about some things. So what we did is Tuesday and Wednesday, we came up with a plan for associations. And so, you know, what I would, would like to do is maybe just first start out by talking about, you know, what does this, the relaxation of the stay home order um, starting on Sunday or Saturday morning, um, you know, and what does the new phase mean? So stay healthy, return starts, return stronger, excuse me, return smarter, return stronger. What does that mean? What does the new governor's order that's going to go into effect, um, you know, on Saturday mean? So I'm kind of following along with my cheat sheet for those of you who want to follow along, um, loosely following along. So you know, first it, it calls for continued social distancing, social connectedness, and it's allowing Arizona businesses, including associations, to, you know, gradually and safe, safely get more back to normal. So obviously that's a great thing. Um, all of us are wanting to get back to our old life, you know, pre-COVID-19. Um, but there's also a reminder, reminder that vulnerable individuals um, who are at risk need to be mindful of their health. And those people, especially now more than ever, um, are needing to you know, make sure that they're taking actions themselves to protect themselves as Arizona starts to reopen um, with the lifting of the stay-at-home order. Um, the, thir the third part of this is um, you know, that individuals, when you're you know, outside of your home, you need to continue to social distance. Um, you need to avoid social settings, you know, where you're going to be having contact directly with, um, you know, more than 10 people. Um, and so, and avoid social distance, avoid social situ situations entirely where social distancing can't occur. 
Um, and so these are all important things for associations to remember because, you know, we're a community and many times associations were, you know, people would go to the pool to socialize with other people and people would have, you know, potluck parties at the pool. And the tennis courts were often a place where people would socialize before and after playing tennis. And so this is a new normal for all of us. And so even though the stay home order is expiring, the new order, stay healthy, return smarter, return stronger, it still has a lot of those same requirements in there that we need to practice social distancing. We need to avoid social settings where appropriate physical distancing can't occur. And we need to um, you know, think about the at-risk people. Um, the last part of this new order that's a little bit more uh, you know, challenging for associations is that we have to establish, develop, implement policies as a business because we're treated just like any other business in Arizona um, based upon guidelines from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, Department of Labor, OSHA, Occupational Safety and Health Organ Administration, and the Arizona Department of Health and Services. So we have to have policies now um, that are complying with many of these different organizations' requirements. And that's kind of a new thing for many associations. You know, we've met some associations maybe that are larger have been dealing with OSHA issues and um, the Department of Labor and CDC, but this is gonna be a newer thing for many of our smaller associations. And those policies that the association is adopting now, um, those need to promote healthy hygiene practices. We need to intensify our cleaning in our associations. We need to be dis disinfecting. They even mentioned that we have to be thinking about ventilation practices, monitoring for sickness going forward, ensuring social distancing, providing necessary protective equipment for maybe employees if an association has an employee and allowing and encouraging teleworking if you have employees, direct employees for your association where feasible. Um, and then we also are required to be limiting the congregation of groups of no more than 10 persons when feasible and in relation to the size of the location. And so that's really gonna come into play with as we start to reopen our pools and our gyms and our associations and our clubhouses, we need to keep all of these different things in mind. And let's face it, this isn't easy. This is difficult, right? Because we're confronted with a new normal. I mean, how many of us got elected to our board and thought that we would be handling these issues right now? These are stressful issues. I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. I serve on my board and we have two owners right now at my association who want to sue our association. And we have been, you know, going back and forth with these owners for several, you know, weeks um, regarding these issues. And it's stressful for even me as a lawyer that's used to litigation and unfortunately is used to, um, you know, having to deal with, you know, the negativity of people being unhappy sometimes. It's even harder when it's your neighbors and it's even harder. So I, I really do, I sympathize with all of you as we start to navigate these new waters and we start to, um, you know, handle these difficult questions that are going to be coming our way. So if I had to guess right now, I would bet that most of you are receiving emails from your owners saying, why haven't you opened up the pool? I want to get back to playing tennis. Why aren't the pickleball courts unlocked? Um, the gym should be reopened. Um, all of these things are being said by owners or residents who aren't thinking about all of the legal responsibilities we have as board members. And like I said at the beginning of this call, these are different than the legal responsibilities that a public pool may have, right? Um, we're operating under very different um, circumstances as a private pool, of course. Yes, we are subject to um, you know, county regulations regarding our pool, but we have ultimate liability if the pool isn't maintained or there's a problem at the pool, such as it's not clean per the CEC standards, you know, who's gonna get sued? The association will be sued. So we have to be thinking about all these things so that we're complying with the new orders and we're also, um, you know, making good decisions to protect liability of our association. So let's talk first about some recommendations and then we're gonna get into um, the questions. And we've received a lot of questions, which is great, so that we can go through them and, and you're welcome too. Um, and I would really like it if you would 
um, just let us know if you haven't already um, where you're watching from, whether it's Phoenix or Scottsdale or Glendale or Chandler. Um, it really helps us to know how far our reach is going. I can see right now that we have 94 people that are live watching and that's awesome. Thanks so much for tuning in today and caring about your associations. Okay, let's start out with four recommendations. So um, number one, communicate with your owners and residents. This is so important because people are really, it's hot. People wanna go back to the pools. People wanna start playing tennis again. Everybody's been really cooped up, right? For the past six weeks. And we want to get back to life being the way it used to be. And so we need as a board to be communicating often with our owners about what's going on. So right now, an appropriate communication would be we we're aware of the new uh, orders that have been issued by our governor. We're working with our trusted advisors to try to reopen the common areas as soon as we can. We hear you. We understand. We want to get back to using the pool again. I want to go play tennis with my kids. Um, you know, we all want to go back to life as normal, but we need to do it in a way that's safe. We need to do it in a way that's going to limit the association's liability. And, you know, please bear with us as we try to navigate these difficult times. Um, and you if you're hearing a lot of negative feedback, like let's say there's a satellite Facebook page or next door is burning up with a lot of negativity, um, make sure that you're upping your communication because you want people to hear from you, um, not the rumor mill, what's really going on. And, and that may need to be, you know, once every two days or every day until we figure out exactly what the plan's gonna be for your common areas. So communication, important now more than ever. Um, number two, consult with your trusted advisors. Make sure that you're talking with your management company right now and make sure that you are talking with your association's attorney to come up with a plan for the many different you know, challenges that we're facing based upon your respective amenities in your association. And every association is different. So when I stayed up all night on Tuesday night thinking about what's the plan for my associations that we work with and for the associations that we'll be tuning in to talk about this today. The plan is, it's, it's hard to, to tell you, you know, a bright line rule plan where this is what every association should do because every association has different amenities and has different financial situation. You know, some associations can hire a guard to, you know, enforce the pool area if people aren't social distancing. Other associations, probably a great, great majority, that's never gonna happen. We can't do that, we can't afford that. We can barely afford things when we're not in a pandemic, right? And so thinking that we're gonna hire a security guard, you know, to monitor that, that's just never gonna happen. So it's not one size fits all. So that's why we need to look at these issues uh, individually with associations. And you should do that with your trusted advisors, your management company, your attorney, uh, you know, your insurance agent for your association, which is the next person. So we're really recommending that if you haven't already, we're recommending that you reach out to your insurance agent. Um, and I actually have been thinking, I'm wondering if my insurance agent um, contacts in Arizona are upset that I'm saying this because probably a lot of you are burning up their phones right now. But remember, you pay them a premium and, and they need to be here for you at this time. Okay, so we're suggesting reach out to your insurance agent as well this time, during this time, and ask them some questions, some important questions that you need to hear answers about are what does our insurance policy cover? You know, is there a virus ex exemption in our policy? Um, why is that important to know? I'm not trying to scare anybody. I'm not trying to create fear and, you know, not tell you that you shouldn't open up your common areas. That's not what I'm doing. I'm just trying to make sure that you're making an informed decision. And if I didn't tell you that, you know, you would blame me later if something happened, right? And say, well, why didn't you tell us to contact our insurance company? We didn't know. And so what, what I'm suggesting that you do is reach out to your insurance agent and ask them about your policy. In fact, even better, ask them to, you know, send you a copy of the policy so you can both look at it together while you're on the phone. And some of the questions that you need to ask are, what if somebody you know, goes into our pool area and claims that they contracted COVID-19? Um, is that, and sues us, is that the type of claim that would be covered under our policy right now? 
and see what they'd say. You know, I'm, I'm guessing that most insurance agents are going to look at the policy and they're going to say, no, that's, that's, you know, not something that's covered. That's an exclusion. Um, and remember that after the SARS pandemic um, several years ago, many insurance companies, you know, changed their policies because they recognized that this could be something that could come up, you know, and that could potentially be an issue for future claims if another pandemic hits. So I'm guessing, you know, 95% of the time you're going to be hearing that a virus is something that will be excluded and wouldn't be covered. Um, you know, one thing that you may want to ask your agent is if we have all the owners in our association sign a, a release of liability form or a waiver, if they, you know, are using the association's common areas, will that limit our liability? And, you know, probably what the agent will say is talk to your attorney. Um, but I'd be curious to hear what they have to say. Um, you know, as an attorney that represents associations in this area, um, and I've been talking to attorneys all around the country about this same topic, is that a waiver of liability or a release of liability, it helps. Is it going to be a bulletproof vest if somebody sues the association? No, it's not. Um, you know, but it, it will help limit our liability. It may make owners may not be as likely to sue if they know that they'll have to fight that waiver that they signed. Um, and I think you need to be really careful how we word the waiver. Um, you know, it, it's going to need to be um, a simple waiver um, that you you can ask your owners or require your owners to sign if they want to use the common areas. Um, you know, it should be pertaining, we suggest that it should be limited to COVID-19 issues, although some other associations that we work with are making them a little bit more expansive and including, you know, any issue, whether it's COVID-19 or not, it, it really just depends on what your association wants in the waiver. Um, you know, what I can tell you just, it's only been a day, right, or a day and a half since the new orders come into play. Some associations have been putting waivers out there to their community and asking, you know, owners to sign these and return them before they can return using the common areas. And I will say that generally the feedback to boards is that owners are don't want to sign them and they are pushing back on it. So um, I think that you you need to hear that because some of you may be thinking about doing it. Um, you know, some people will sign are signing them and returning them, but some owners aren't. Um, also, many associations just aren't set up to be, um, you know, a repository for waivers, right? They, they don't have a management company. They don't have a way to get them out. They don't have a way to update them. They don't have anybody at the gate, you know, to enforce you can't enter if you don't have a waiver on file. And so for some associations, they're going to look at this and they're going to say, it's not practical for us to implement this. Our owners won't sign it and therefore we're not going to do it. I'm just mentioning this to you as your attorney um, that this is something you may wanna consider. I'm not saying you have to do this in order to reopen your com common areas. These are all recommendations. Um, and if it's something that your association wants to do to limit liability and you think it's something that can work for your association, um, you know, you may want to look into this further. And if you do, give me a call and we can talk about it more. Um, the last thing I'm going to say is, if there's anything I've learned through this pandemic, it is that things change. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, my personality type is I don't like change. Um, I go to a restaurant and I typically will order the same thing um, because that's just how I, I, I roll. But this pandemic has taught all of us how change is necessary. And, you know, what I'm going to tell you right now, you're probably not going to want to hear. But this is going to change, right? There's going to be new orders that are put out there. And what we decide right now in this phase for reopening our common areas um, is going to change. And it's going to change in response to what happens in our country, what happens in our state. And I don't know if any of you were watching the news recently in Arizona, but, um, you know, people are getting out, right? People are in Tempe, they're going out, people are getting out like they haven't been in six weeks. And so if that continues and we see an increase in, um, you know, certain factors that our government's looking at, I mean, we could go right back to having, you know, a shutdown again. I hope not. I really hope not. But 
you know, we have to be flexible in this time. And while many of you may be reopening your common areas, we may need to reevaluate this as circumstances change, which I can tell you right now is going to be hard um, and difficult for us as board members, but we're all just doing our best. So remember when you're communicating with your owners, I actually said this to one of the owners yesterday that was um, really giving me a hard time about being a board member in my association. I reminded this person, hey, I'm a neighbor here too, and I'm a volunteer, and we're trying to do our best to make the best decisions for our community. And I really would appreciate it if you would be a little nicer in your interactions with our board because we're just trying to do the best we can for your community, for our community. And, um, you know, the person really softened up when I said that. So you might want to think about that as a strategy. Okay. On our cheat sheet, we came up with a plan for um, reopening the pool, um, including signage and some different considerations that the board should do. And we did that for pools. We did it for gyms and fitness centers. Um, we gave you samples for tennis, pickleball, bocce ball, horseshoe areas, shuffleboard, clubhouses. Um, and how we set it up is we started the analysis on the cheat sheet. And again, this cheat sheet can be found either in this, uh, this email or this thread for the Facebook Live. We posted it under the comments section or also on our website from okahewawfirm.com. Um, is that we, we give you suggestions for the sign. And I think that the common denominator there is that um, we're trying to limit our liability on the sign, right? Especially if you're not having the owners in your community sign waivers, which I think probably a lot of associations are not going to do. Um, you want to make sure that, and we give you the actual language, we put quotes around what we think your sign should say. And we wrote this, you know, in conjunction with looking at what the Arizona Department of Health Services placed on their recommendations um, on their website regarding reopening pools and reopening gyms. So basically we're, we're saying to them, when you enter this facility, whatever it is, the pool, the clubhouse, that you're entering at your own risk and that COVID-19 may be present. And then we go on to say that stay home if you are sick or a higher risk individual and stay uh, at least six feet away from other patrons who do not live in your household. Do not touch your eyes, nose, or mouth. After leaving the, whatever the amenity is, um, pool, whatever, gym, um, use hand sanitizer or wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. Um, and all these uh, recommendations were, like I said, on the Arizona Department of Health Services website, when they, which they issued on Tuesday evening. Um, and they're all listed on our, our cheat sheet. Um, and, you know, then you're going to have to look at the amenity and you're going to have to think about, um, you know, what are special considerations for that particular amenity and for pools and for uh gyms. We got a lot of different things we got to think about. And so I'm sorry if I gave you overkill analysis, um, but on our cheat sheet, then we talk about what are some considerations for the board as you reopen the pool. And there are a lot of them. And I'm not saying you have to do any of them or all of the considerations. What my job here as your attorney is to think about things that you need to be aware of that you may want to implement to either limit your liability or to, you know, create a safer environment in your community. And so think about those considerations that I have listed on the cheat sheet for each one of these and decide what works best for your association. And let's be real here. There's no right answer, right? This is our first pandemic that we're all going through. Um, try to make the best decisions you can for your community as you're reopening these different amenities. And don't forget to reach out to your trusted advisors of your, your manager, your attorney, and your insurance agent and ask for their advice on it. Um, and we're here to help you. That's our role in this, in this pandemic um, and to help you make good choices. So I, I highly recommend that you go to our cheat sheet on reopening common areas that you look at each amenity and that you look at the proposed sign language that we give and that you also look at the considerations for the board and decide what works best for your community. Okay, let's go now and start looking at some of the questions um, that we have. And um, what we're doing is I'm just going through the Facebook live feed and I'm gonna try to cover as many of them as I can. Um, so let's see, Maureen is writing, everyone here is torn open the pool or keep it closed? And for how long? Liability or no liability? 
What about people who are demanding dues refunds? Not sure there are answers. Uh, amen, Maureen. These are tough questions. So I'm going to try to just give you the best advice I can. Um, you know, so should we open our pool or should we close it? I mean, I think your board just needs to meet and, you know, go through the pros and cons and think about what your homeowners are asking. You know, if there's a large number of homeowners that, you know, want the pool to be reopened, that's a factor that you have to think about. Um, because remember, we are elected by our constituents and, and our constituents, our homeowners, our neighbors. Um, if you are going to reopen it, um, look through our, you know, suggested information on our cheat sheet. So go through what type of signage we suggest that you post. Um, go through all of the considerations that, you know, we've listed about sanitation and, um, you know, social distancing and, um, you know, how often the areas are going to be cleaned and do you need to remove pool furniture, all the different things. It's all there. And then just try to make the best decision you can after getting homeowner input, talking to your trusted advisors, reading through the considerations, and then go for it. That's, that's the bottom line. You have to make a decision. Um, if your decision is to reopen it, we really recommend that you, um, you know, have a plan in place. You don't just unlock the gate and make it a free for all um, because the plan is going to be important in limiting our liability. And you're going to want to make sure that the minutes where you're discussing these actions, you know, mention that you, you know, attended this, this seminar, that you looked at publications written on this subject, you talked to your insurance agent, um, you know, whatever actions you took, because all of that is written evidence that's going to limit your liability in case something bad happens, right? And somebody, you know, does contract something at your association and sues you. Okay, if you decide not to reopen your pool, that is okay too. Um, just make sure that you have good reasoning for it and make sure that you communicate with your, your owners. And maybe it's not that we're never going to reopen the pool. Maybe it's that we're going to wait a little bit longer. We're going to wait two weeks or, and we're really thinking through what we, we want to do here. Um, I'm, I know, obviously, I told you I serve on my board. That's not going to be a popular decision, right? That is going to be something that people are going to be upset about. So you want to make sure that you have great communication on this and that you don't just say it's, it's closed until November, right? Because that's not that's going to result in a petition to remove the board. Let's be real here. So um, if you're going to close it, you know, make sure that you're communicating how long till you reevaluate it so that people have, you know, some information that they can, you know, feel comfortable with. Um, what about owners that are saying, I want a refund on my dues because the pool has been closed for two months or a month or however long you've had it closed. Um, you know, no, they're not entitled to a refund. And, um, you know, we want to be nice how we say, respond to that. Um, I think we just need to remind the owner that, you know, we still had to maintain the amenity, even though it was closed. And unfortunately, um, you know, even though it wasn't in use, we still had expenses on it. And therefore, we can't give you a dues refund. And we wish we could. We wish the situation was different. Um, but we can't. Um, the next one is from Gina. Uh, Gina, uh, advice on opening pools. Who will keep these areas clean? Who will confront homeowners who don't follow guidelines? How about swim practice or swim meets? Um, okay, so advice on opening the pools. Um, again, I just want to refer you back to our cheat sheet um, on reopening common areas that can be found on our webpage. Um, and also in this uh, comment link for this Facebook Live, it's in there as well. Um, you know, Who's going to keep the areas clean? That it's going to depend on your association, right? Some associations have uh, a on-site cleaning crew, and it's going to be significantly easier for those associations to have their cleaning crew clean to CDC standards. Um, and that's great. That's going to make this decision a lot easier for those associations. But what about the associations that have a pool? But maybe previously they only cleaned the pool once a week, bi-weekly, once a month. What do they do, right? We already did our budget for 2020. We don't have, you know, a $10,000 cleaning budget. So what do they do to, you know, survive these times? Well, they may say we're not going to reopen the pool. They may say we're going to reopen it, but our sign is going to clearly state, use at your own risk. And this is how often we clean the pool. 
and, you know, warn people that, you know, we don't have, you know, a, you know, a daily cleaning of this area. And, and that's OK, as long as you're, you know, you're warning them and people are making informed decisions when they walk in that gate to enter the pool or the tennis court or whatever, you know, that's fine. Please have some assurances that, you know, while it's not what we would prefer, of course, we all want to have, you know, cleaning crew come in in hazmat suits and clean it every two minutes. But that's not the reality that we're dealing with here in many associations in Arizona. So just do your best, but make sure that you're letting your owners know what's going on so that they don't have any false assurances that something's being done when it's really not. Um, what about swim practice or swim meets? Um, you know, can we do that now? You know, I would advise against doing that in this phase. Um, and this is just my opinion, but, um, you know, I think that's going to violate social distancing uh, recommend recommendations. And it's also going to violate the new um, order that our governor is going to be having in place starting Saturday um, of not having gatherings, you know, of, of 10 people. Um, or more. And so I would really advise against that at this stage right now, because I think it's too early. The next stage, we'll get more back to normal, um, you know, when some of those requirements are lifted. But right now, having swim practice or swim meets, I don't think is a good idea. Now, people lap swimming in a pool. I think that's okay right now, you know, as long as social distancing is being followed. Um, it's awesome to see how many live questions there are coming in. And so I'm just gonna start going through them. Vern, great to hear from you. Uh, one of my favorite managers that I work with. Um, many boards claim that since the HOA swimming pool is semi-private, they feel they are not required to follow CDC or state restrictions to open them. How do we convince them that it's in their best interest to follow the CDC guidelines in reopening the pool and spa? Great question. Um, Vern, you're 100% right. I do think they are subject to the CDC guidelines and state restrictions. Um, and I think that uh, boards need to be mindful of that. And so one thing I would suggest is that you give them a copy of my cheat sheet and have them look at two areas. Um, the first area that they should look at is what is the new May 12th order that um, our governor in Arizona put out, the stay healthy, return smarter, return stronger order. Um, as part of that order, it says that businesses are required to follow all these different procedures. So it's right there, black and white. You need to do this. Um, and remember, associations are a business. We're a nonprofit corporation. And that new order specifically says that nonprofits are subject to this as well. So I would suggest that you give them a copy of my cheat sheet, um, you know, and and make sure that they read it because it's very clear that they are you know responsible for doing this okay maureen kane if an hoa doesn't have resources suggested in the cheat sheet um then what we can't supply daily sanitizer or clean railings or chairs or the drinking fountain after every use or keeping gatherings from occurring the board is split and so am i i get it like i said i stayed up all night on tuesday night thinking through all these different things for associations and, you know, these are tough calls. You know, I frankly, I was kind of tortured by everything when I read it because I, I knew that these questions were going to come up. And, you know, I don't have, you know, in the law, you want to have a bright line rule. I want to be like, here's the answer. Um, but this is like the bar exam. There's no right answer, right? <laughs> it's a game. You got to it's you got to just figure out what is the best interest of your association. So. Here's what I suggest. Um, okay, if you don't have the resources to supply daily hand sanitizers, you can't do it, right? I can't even find hand sanitizer. I'm trying to make it with my kids right now. And if my kids are watching, get to work on that. We've been keeping that in our, in big containers in our bathroom and we haven't had time to do it yet. But, um, you know, so that's okay. Um, you know, if you can't find daily sanitizer, hand sanitizer, okay, it's not gonna happen, right? So that's a no. If you don't have wipes, don't do it, right? Um, we don't have an on-site person to clean the railings, wash down the grill, you know, all these different things. Maybe you need to not reopen the grill then, or maybe you need to put a sign on the grill saying, you know, sanitize with your own product before and after use. These aren't being sanitized, okay? That's, you know, a possible solution here. 
Some associations may deactivate their drinking fountains, right? They may just put a sign on them too saying this isn't sanitized. Um, use at your own risk or sanitize before and after use. Um, how do we keep gatherings from occurring, right? When you open that pool, you just know there's going to be somebody that comes in with a whole bunch of family that is not somebody that lives with them, right? And they're going to have a bunch of people there. A couple thoughts on that. Um, remember, if you're at risk, you know, don't go to the pool because you're putting yourself in danger. Number two, if you see these people doing this, you know, we all really need to think about, okay, well, what are our options here? Um, you know, are our options, you know, should the board be out there enforcing it? Come on. No, we know that's, you know, never going to be something that will work long term. And so, you know, you may want to put on the sign. It's, you know, it's self-monitoring on this. We encourage you as our board to do this. Um, you know, we're requesting that you do this for everybody's health and safety, but, you know, it's self-monitoring. And, you know, one thing that I've noticed that's been really kind of interesting as part of the, the pandemic is some people, you know, are calling out other people for what they're doing. And it's actually kind of interesting. Um, so maybe somebody else at the pool may say, hey, that's not cool, you know, that you're bringing all these people in here. And maybe some of these issues will be resolved that way. I hope there's not going to be a lot of fighting on this. But um, so it's really going to depend. Maybe you have a, a security guard there, you know, or maybe you have other personnel from your association who are there um, to remind people to, you know, not be violating social distancing. It, it just really depends on what your resources are for your association as to how you handle this. And I'd encourage you if you do reopen the pool and, you know, people start violating, you know, your social distancing requirements, you know, reach out to our firm. We can give you some suggestions. Some that, you know, come to mind right off the bat would be maybe you need to reclose the pool down. You know, I don't want to do that because we're punishing everybody because of the behavior of one. Um, I think we saw that in beaches and, you know, some area in, in near Los Angeles where the governor said, hey, stop. You know, you guys can't handle it, so we're going to close it. Um, and that, I think, was a pretty effective, you know, way for that, for them to get the, whatever result they wanted, people not to, you know, park it at the beach and not social distance. Um, you know, I think we, we have to look at, our, can we find them? Yes, possibly. Can we call the police? You know, probably not the best way to resolve this because the police are busy. Um, you know, can we send them a reminder letter? Yes, that would be something you could do. Um, you know, can we prohibit them from being in the pool because they did this? You know, check your documents. Let's see if there's something in there that would allow us to suspend their use privileges for violating the rules. So I think we're going to have to look at it based on a case-by-case -case basis. But, um, you know, don't torture yourself over these decisions. Do your best. So if you don't have ways to, you know, monitor, you know, people, whether they're social distancing or not, then place on your sign that, you know, it's self-monitored. And, you know, these are our, you know, what we are, you know, these are the pool rules now that you have to do this. And, but it is self-monitored. So everybody's clear that, you know, the board members aren't going to be coming out there with the clipboard and, you know, cameras and, and taking pictures of people. Okay, next question from Gina. How do you deal with a board, just, board member that just wants everything open? Um, I get it. <laughs> um, I get that more than you know. So, um, a couple things. Um, you know, I think that we have to all remember that one board member um, doesn't make a decision. It's a majority of the board. So everybody, to have a good board, actually, it's good to have differing views because, um, you know, you're not just rubber stamping everything. So I, I think the way that we handle it, and, um, you know, like I said, I'm familiar with this situation, is that you try to get the board together to meet, to everybody to discuss it together. And remember that decisions in an association are made by a majority of board members. And, you know, I've been outvoted on my board. Got to tell you, it doesn't feel good, but you got to go along with it when you're a board member. Um, and if a majority of the board chooses to do something or not do something, you know, that's the way it goes. That's how associations are set up. Um, and, you know, you may you may need to bring in one of your trusted advisors if your board is split to help you make a good decision for your community. Okay, the next question from Robin. Robin, great to hear from you. I haven't talked to you in a little while, so nice to see you watching. 
um, the HOA cannot police usage of the pool. Once the padlock is off, anyone can access it via their key. We can't monitor during pool hours, maintain how many people are at the pool, sanitize it. How do we mitigate our liability? Okay, well, good question for you know your attorney, also for your insurance agent. Um, you know, this is an, a situation that many associations are going to be in. Just make sure if you're taking the padlock off um, that you know the risks. And how are you going to know the risks? You're listening to the seminar today, right? The risk is somebody could contract the disease and you could be sued. Um, you've talked to your insurance agent and you understand that there may or may not, more likely not, be coverage of your association if somebody sues the association, you know, for contracting the virus. Um, but you may have taken some actions to limit your liability. Maybe you have the owner sign a release if that's something that would work for your association or a waiver of liability. You know, maybe your signage um, is, you know, indicates all of this. Um, we can't monitor this. We're, you know, we, we can't monitor social distancing. Um, we're unable to sanitize it other than this, enter at your own risk. Um, and go back and look at our considerations from the board under the pool, um, you know, reopening the pool recommendations on our newest cheat sheet on this and just go through all the different things. And, you know, then make sure you're documenting that sign. Take a picture of it once you put it up there and put it in your record so that we have it in case we ever need to defend, you know, a lawsuit, hopefully not in the future. One more thing on lawsuits, you know, somebody asked me this this week, how is someone ever going to be able to prove that they got the virus from our association? And I mean, I agree, right? This is like, it's going to be really difficult because people, they don't just stay home in their bubble, right? They're going to the grocery store and now with things reopening, I mean, there's going to be exposure from a number of different places if somebody does get it. And so I think that's a point that's really well taken. You know, how are they going to be able to prove that you got it at, you know, the ABC Association pool? Um, I was, you know, like all of us, I'm watching all these news shows um, and they did a little like simulation on one of these news shows where they had evaluated through um, tracing after somebody got it. Um, they did a restaurant scene and they had traced back that, I don't know, like, eight people who were dining in a restaurant um, all contracted the COVID-19. You know, and they had where everybody was sitting at the tables. And it was just, it was just bizarre because some of the people got it, some of the people didn't, you know, and, it, and they thought maybe that it might be due to like how the air was circulating in the room. So these are all unknown questions. So don't torture yourself over it. It, it is what it is. We're all doing the best. We're trying to make the best decisions we can. My role is to, you know, give you the options. You're going to make the choice. You're going to, you know what your liability threshold is. You know what your risk threshold is. My job is just to, you know, explain these are all the different things you can consider. And then just do your best. Make your best decision that you can and document everything. You know, document that you're listening to this. Document that you read the cheat sheet, document that you called your insurance agent. All of these things, you know, show that you really were trying to make the best decision for your association. Okay, um, let's see. Can we post signage? Let me see if I missed anything. No. Okay, Barb, uh, can we post signage that the use of the pool and common areas constitute a release of liability to the association and management? Um, you know, I think we're kind of already doing that with the language that I, you know, suggest in um, our cheat sheet on reopening common areas. You know, we're saying use at your own risk. COVID-19 may be present. Um, you know, you certainly can, you know, also change that up a little bit and say, you know, that you're releasing the association from liability. But traditionally, a release of liability has a signature by an owner. Um, and the association and, um, you know, that's, or at least by the owner should be signing it um, and the association typically writes it. So, um, you know, I don't, I'm not, if they don't sign it, I don't think that it's, it's the same, but we can keep copies of the pictures um, that you post at the common areas. And, you know, I think that you should at least at a minimum as per our cheat sheet have enter at your own risk and, you know, COVID-19 may be present as per what we wrote on our cheat sheet. Okay, next question, Phil. Can a use at your own risk clause be written into the declaration? 
Uh, really interesting that you asked this because I'm on a, a different um, email trail with a number of attorneys around the country and, and we were talking about that. So yes, definitely it could. Um, a friend of mine uh, who's a very successful attorney um, in another part of the country has been talking about this a lot. Um, you know, yes, we could. Yes, we could also write something in the CCNRs that, um, you know, talks about pandemics and that protects us from liability, of course. Um, but in order to do that now, we need to have a vote of the membership, right? Because most of our association CCNRs declarations require a vote of the membership to do this. So yes, definitely that's something we can do. Um, it's going to take a little while to get the votes, but it is something that we, we definitely could do. Um, and the owners would have to vote on it and approve it, you know, according to whatever your documents say in order to amend the documents, the CCNRs. Would it then apply to any user of a common area as an aspect of the declarations? Um, you know, yes, in theory it would. Could it be an adhesion contract? Possibly. Um, an adhesion contract is where, um, you know, people are, so typically we see it in the case where the developer writes into the CCNRs, you can't sue the developer <laughs> um, uh, of the association for construction defects. Um, and of course, when people buy in an association, um, they can't negotiate that contract. So then typically associations, if they have construction defects, will argue to the court, hey, this is an adhesion contract. We never were able to negotiate this. The developer wrote the contract. Um, and so, of course, the owners that voted against this, they could argue, hey, this is an adhesion contract and therefore it's not enforceable. So none of these are perfect solutions, but I like how you're thinking outside the box, Bill, and it might be something that becomes a standard provision in CCNRs going forward after the pandemic. Okay, Deborah, I'm president of a small community with all adults, so I'm guessing this means a 55 and over community. I have posted signs indicating it is not possible to sanitize tables, chairs, and lounges after each use. I've turned everything upside down to discourage use and distributed notices to each home and put on the gates that homeowners who use the area do so at their own risk and the association will not be responsible for any illness. Is that enough? Boy, that's like the million dollar question right now. I, I don't know. I, I wish I could say, yes, that's, you know, you've done everything you need to do. You've checked every box. So I think that you're you're making an effort, obviously. Um, it's a small community. It sounds like it's 55 and over. You're communicating to them via the, the posting that you're not able to sanitize. You're using the area at their own risk. The association is not going to be responsible for any illness. Like we already kind of talked about this, that whether or not that may or may not be enforceable um, because they didn't sign it. I don't know if it's enough or not. What I would suggest is talk to your insurance agent talk to your attorney, tell them a little bit more about, you know, I'd actually like to see the copy of the sign and, and maybe look at some pool rules that you may have put in place pursuant to our considerations that we have listed on our cheat sheet. I mean, I don't know enough about the situation to, you know, give you the A-OK -okay and thumbs up on it, but it sounds like you're in, moving in the right direction, but you might need to do a little fine tuning to limit your liability a little bit more. So thanks for your question, Deborah. Linda, Linda. Linda is one of our most um, ardent supporters. She comes to a lot of our seminars. So good to see you here, Linda. Can't wait to see you again in person at our next seminar, um, hopefully in the near future. So Linda asks, is signage reminding residents to social distance and observe proper hygiene enough as we can't afford 12 hour security? Okay, great question, Linda. I think it's kind of along the same response that I gave to the, this, the, most, pre, the most prior question. Um, you know, I think what you need to do is go look at our cheat sheet, look at the language that we suggest for the sign, and then go through all of the considerations and see which ones you can and can't do. If you're not able to do something, make sure that you're putting on there what you, you know, if you're not able to sanitize, make sure you're saying that. Um, and talk to your insurance agent, like I said, talk to, you know, your attorney, which I know is, is our firm for your association. And let's come up with a plan that's going to limit your liability as best possible. So I think you're in, in moving in the right direction, but I think maybe you do need to do a little bit more there. Okay, Brandy. Brandy's one of the managers we work with. Thanks so much for being here today, Brandy. Um, can a 55 plus community have returning snowbirds self-quarantine? Really good question. Okay, because the governor's orders will be changing um, starting Saturday night at 11.59 p.m., 
um, you know, and we're under the new uh, stay healthy, return, start smarter, return stronger. Um, my understanding is, is that that quarantine requirement for people coming from hotbed areas that was in place maybe in mid-March, um, you know, or maybe it was the beginning of April or whatever, um, I believe that's expiring. So can we still require that? Um, you know, I think, you know, you may, that would be something that you may be able to implement as an emergency rule if you're very concerned about that. Um, but the requirements that the state put in, in place on that um, are going to expire on Saturday. Um, and I think you just really kind of need to also reevaluate where we are in our country. If they're coming from a hot spot, if they're, you know, I think there's a lot of different things that we have to evaluate there as to whether or not we're you know, going to do that. And I'm almost wondering, Brandy, if you're thinking about the snowbirds that are going to be coming in November, like October, November, December, um, I think we're going to have to look at what's going on then to determine if you know that's something we want to do. And that may even be something we would put an amendment over the summer um, to you know kind of think ahead on something that could happen you know, this fall. But again, there's so many unknowns right now in terms of what what our summer is going to look like, what our fall is going to look like, our winter. Um, you know, it, it's going to be really tough to um, you know comment on that at this time. But I would probably say right now, I think it might be overkill once the order expires. Um, I, I think you're going to get pushback on that from from people. So that would be you know my initial action right now. But I, I'd like to hear more if, if you want to call me. We can talk about it more. Okay, Rick, also one of our clients from Scottsdale. Good to see you here, Rick. Uh, we are not limiting the number of people in our pool area, but we are requiring six feet of social distancing. Is this adequate? Um, I mean, again, it's not one size fit all for associations. I know exactly where your association is. I've been there. Um, I have been in the pool area for a meeting. Um, it's not, you know, an Olympic size pool. So there's not a ton of space in there. Rick, what I would really suggest your association do is go to our cheat sheet, look at the considerations that we have for you. Um, you know, look at the signage requirement that we're suggesting, look at the different considerations and figure out what you can and can't do. Um, you know, I think based upon your association's pool area, you, you may want to impl implement some limits on the number of people. But again, who's going to enforce it? Um, you know, so I think... I think it would be a good idea, knowing how small that pool area is, to at least put it in writing um, and say that it's you know going to be self-monitoring on it. Um, so thanks for your question, Rick. Good to hear from you. Can't wait to see you again in person. Okay, Michael Ott, how can someone prove they contracted COVID at the pool or any other common amen amenity? Yeah, that's going to be real tough. I agree. And we talked about that a minute ago. It is going to be you know difficult the causation element of suing. An association, um, you know, how can they prove that, you know, our pool or our area, whatever it is, caused it? I agree. That's going to be difficult. And I think that's an argument towards let's reopen our pools and tennis courts and pickleball, pickleball courts um, as long as we put some of these suggested, you know, signage and considerations that are listed on our, our cheat sheet in place. So good question. Can an HOA, this is from Sharon, can an HOA put quarantine measures in place for new owners moving into our community? Okay, um, that's a little different than, um, well, I guess it's kind of not. It's the same one as the, the one that we saw a few minutes ago, um, you know, from Brandy. So I think maybe it's, I think we're past that now, probably, because the stay home order is going to expire on, um, you know, Saturday night at 11.59. The other order that, you know, required people to quarantine who are coming from hotspots that was issued by our governor, um, you know, in March or early April, that also is expiring. So I think the timing on this might not be good for you to, to, you know, put that type of a measure in place. But, you know, give us a call. And if there's a special situation that you have that you think that it should be done, we can talk about it. Um, but I'm, I'm thinking that the timing maybe is we're past that now. Okay, Barbara Boss Hooper, let's see, what recourse would owners have if we don't open? So really good question. So let's look at it from, we're closing the pool, what, you know, or whatever, we're, it's not gonna be reopened right now. 
or we're not going to reopen the tennis courts or the gym or whatever. And the gym, we haven't talked much about the gym, but the gym is a little more complicated than the pool, right? Maybe many of you don't have a gym. Um, but so what recourse do owners have they have is that um, they can sue us, right? Um, and they can say that we aren't being reasonable in our decisions and that by, you know, not reopening whatever the area is that we have limited them from enjoyment of, you know, the property pursuant to what the CCNRs, you know, dictate that they are allowed to use and have, you know, an access easement to use the common areas. Um, if you're not going to reopen your common areas, I think it's really important that you're communicating, number one, with your owners, why? And then also that you are documenting the specific reasons why you aren't doing it. And definitely reach out to your trusted advisors, whether it's your insurance agent, your management company, your attorney, um, and have them weigh in on it to support you for the reasons why you're not reopening. Um, and, and know that you're not alone. I got an email yesterday from um, Surprise indicating that they aren't reopening some of their amenities because they don't have budgeting, you know, to do it. So know that you're not alone. There are other, um, you know, even you know, city amenities that they, they're not doing it. So, and that's okay. Okay, Fran, if we don't open and don't give a rebate on dues, can homeowners sue us for breach of contract? Um, please comment on special guidelines for a small, under 300, you know, lot, 55 plus community. Okay, so we don't open. We're not giving you your money back for dues because, you know, the pool is closed or whatever the amenity is. Can they sue us for breach of contract? Well, they can sue you for just about, you know, anything. Anybody can sue any, for anybody for anything. Um, so breach of contract is going to be one, breach of fiduciary duty, um, you know, I'm sure that if they have a crafty plaintiff's lawyer, there'll be lots of different counts if there is a lawsuit. Um, you know, I guess the best argument or the best answer back to you, Bar or Fran, is the same thing that I told Barbara. You know, just document your decision really well so you have a good defense if that should happen. Um, you know, make sure that you indicate the reasons why you're not reopening. Make sure you're reaching out to your trusted advisors so that they can help you make a good decision here and so that you have good rationale and reasoning for why you're not reopening. Claudette had a homeowner who said the pool is private and should not have been closed, should have been left open. How would you respond? Oh, isn't it wonderful having a Monday morning quarterback to help you through these difficult times as a board member, right? Um, okay, so Claudette, my heart goes out to you. These are, you know, these type of questions come when you serve on a volunteer board and you give up a lot of your time to make your community better. Okay, here's the quick answer. So tell the homeowner, we really appreciate your feedback. Thank you for caring about our community. Um, you know, these are unprecedented times. And as board members, we have a fiduciary duty to act in the best interests of um, our association. Yes, our pool is semi-private as defined by Maricopa County or whatever county you live in. But we have a responsibility to keep things safe and to make sure that our residents are safe. And many attorneys throughout the Valley, as a matter of fact, I don't know any attorney that practices in this area that didn't advise their clients to close these common areas where there was high traffic during the COVID-19 pandemic. So we relied on our trusted advisor's advice and we relied on what we thought was in the best interest of the association to keep our residents safe and then just smile and don't say anything else. Um, okay, Jay Adkins, our annual meeting is defined as our May meeting to vote on board members. Is it permissible for this meeting to be postponed and the board members to continue violate without violating a legal statute? So I don't know when your meeting is in May, um, but what we're advising all of our associations that we work with, and this pertains to regular board meetings and to annual meetings, special meetings of the membership, removal meetings, and you know, I have a removal meeting coming up here soon for an association, is do these meetings virtually um, using a teleconferencing system or a conference call system. And last week we uh, released a new cheat sheet on the topic of conducting a virtual meeting. And um, you can find that on our website at mulcahylawfirm.com, or we can also share it with you right now, Jay, um, on our on this uh, Facebook Live um, feed. Um, and 
you know, it has great suggestions on how to conduct a virtual meeting. So, you know, bottom line is we're seeing, um, using uh, virtual technology, teleconferencing or a conference call. Um, if you don't want to do that or you don't feel comfortable doing that, what we would su suggest is that you just notify your owners that you're postponing it and that it will be rescheduled and give them a timeline. Um, remember, though, that under Arizona law, you are required to have an annual meeting once a year. So be sure that you get that annual meeting in um, before the end of 2020 and be sure that you're telling your owners what you're doing and the rationale. And, um, you know, you shouldn't be if, it, if you're postponing regular board meetings, you know, really try to start conducting them virtually, if, if at all possible, or by conference call. Um, and we have a lot of suggestions that make it really easy for you to do that if you if you read our new cheat sheet on that. Um, if you're not going to be having regular board meetings right now, I have some clients that are saying, you know what, the snowbirds are gone. It's quiet in Arizona. We don't need to have a board meeting right now. That's OK, too. But just make sure you're not violating the open meeting law by making decisions, you know, by email, um, you know, that you're violating the law um, because you still do need to comply with the law, even in these difficult pandemic times. Okay, uh, Fran, um, my insurance agent said my HOA has no liability and no coverage for the virus. Can all of my homeowners be held responsible if someone claims they got COVID-19 in the common area? So, I, okay, so my HOA has no liability. I guess I don't, I'd have to hear more about that comment because um, I'm pretty sure I 100% disagree with that. I mean, an association has responsibility to maintain the common areas. Um, so I can't agree with that statement. No coverage on the virus. If your agent said that, that does not surprise me. Um, so can we now flip the, you know, this and say all owners are responsible if someone claims they got it? Um, you know, I'd have to see how your association is set up. But if you're set up as a corporation, which, you know, 99.999% of associations are, um, you know, the homeowners cannot be held individually liable due to the corporate shield of the nonprofit corporation. Um, and so my, my quick answer on that without knowing more would be, you know, no, the association ultimately could be held liable if, if causation can be proved. Okay, Lisa, one of the managers I work with in the East Valley, thanks for uh, being here today. A resident just said, we have to post notice to open signs seven days before reopening the facility the facility. Are you familiar with that rule? No, I'm not. Um, now, that may be something that applies to, you know, municipal pools. I don't know, but I'm not, to answer your question, I'm not familiar with that. And we're not, I haven't heard anything that would require me to tell my clients that we need to do that. It was not in the recommendations that were issued by the Department of, of Health Services in Arizona. So um, my opinion on that would be no. And remember, we're a semi-private pool um, in an association. So we're not, you know, a public pool. Um, should signs, Debbie, should signs be specific to guidelines or can you state residents are required to follow CDC guidelines since the guidelines will most likely change from time to time? Okay, really great question. Um, you know, I think probably the way to handle it is most people don't really know Specifically, I mean, I think we all have a pretty good idea what the CDC guidelines are like on hand washing and social distancing, but, um, you know, we don't really have, um, you know, at the tip of our fingers, you know, exactly what CDC guidelines are. So I think you really do need to give homeowners some, you know, information about what they can and can't be doing on your signs. Um, of course, at the bottom of the sign, you could say as the CDC guidelines, you know, change, um, you know, you please make sure that you follow CDC guidelines in place now or in the future. You could add a sentence like that. That would kind of cover it if things change. Um, next question from Mark. If we call a virtual emergency meeting to discuss our pool, do we have to invite homeowners to participate? Oh, Mark, as a board member myself, I feel your pain. Um, you know, yes, I'm sorry to say this, but yes, you do. Um, you know, the only way that you could make this an executive session is if you have your attorney present and um, you talk about it um, with your attorney or maybe you're conveying advice regarding um, what your attorney told you, um, then you could make it into an executive session. Um, and so if you are calling an emergency meeting and it's virtual to discuss whether or not to open or, 
you know, not open your pool. Um, one way to make it an executive session where owners wouldn't be allowed to attend would be um, to um, make sure that you've talked to your attorney and you're conveying the, you know, what the attorney's advice was, or maybe you have your attorney dial into that virtual meeting to give advice on that call. Um, but, you know, on the flip side of that, you know, I know that sometimes a meeting like this is going to be difficult, but at least you'd know if it's an, during an open meeting, at least you'd know how people really feel about it. And you'd be representing the wishes of the community if you do allow them to attend, you know, in an open meeting when you're not going to have your attorney there, or maybe you do have your attorney at the open meeting. Um, you know, just something to think about because we want to be responsive to our homeowners, although we all know that's going to be a really difficult meeting. Um, and I would go into it knowing that um, at least you would know how your homeowners feel. And I listened in on a meeting um, yesterday where we had half the people that wanted to open it and half that didn't. And, you know, it was a difficult meeting, but I think at least everybody understood everybody's position. And ultimately what that client decided to do was they said, um, you know, the people that don't want it to reopen, they have a choice. They can not use the amenity. Um, and, you know, that's what that dissociation decided to do. And they did reopen, ultimately reopen the pool with signage and, and taking into consideration all the considerations that we had on our cheat sheet. Um, okay, uh, Deborah, I have homeowners telling me um, UV rays will kill the virus. Most of the furniture is under a Ramada, which does not get full sun all day. How do I answer that in a way that keeps everyone safe? Um, I, you know, I... That's a tough question. I mean, of course, we are hearing um, that because, you know, the sun is out in Arizona a lot, that this could be something that could kill the virus. But we don't really have any conclusive scientific evidence, you know, that supports that, that we can rely on. Um, and so while we hope that's the case, you know, if it's going to be hot, might as well have a, a benefit with the sun that's going to kill the virus right now. Um, we don't have any scientific evidence that that is our, you know, going to be our defense here. And so, you know, what I would respond to is, um, you know, thanks for bringing that to our attention. You know, we really do hope that this is um, something that will, you know, make everybody safer in Arizona, but there's no scientific evidence of this. Um, and, you know, maybe they're saying, can you move the furniture to get full sun? I mean, that's a board decision if you want to do that or not. But I don't think that we can rely on that, that that's going to, you know, prevent the virus from being present in your association. Um, and so how do I keep my answer in a way that keeps everyone safe? You know, we really appreciate you, you know, providing us with that feedback. And we've talked with an attorney about it. And the attorney said, you know, we don't have any scientific evidence, you know, one way or the other on that. And of course, if, if a majority of the board decides that we want to move the pool furniture to a different location, we certainly can, but we shouldn't rely on that as being something that will, um, you know, protect us. So, okay, that is the end of our live questions. Um, we've been live now for about an hour and 15 minutes, just a little bit under that. And so I'd just like to make some closing remarks for those of you who may have joined us now and for those of you who have listened to the entire presentation. First, thank you so much for being here today um, and listening in to um, our seminar on this or Facebook Live on this important topic. Um, really, board members, managers, it's a really difficult time for all of us, even attorneys that practice in the area of association law. This is a difficult time. And I really commend all of you for caring about your communities and trying to make the best possible decision that you can for your communities. Um, know that we're here for you and that I you know, want to help you any way I can to limit your stress, um, to give you a feeling of assurances that um, you know, what you're doing is you know, the best possible choice for your association. So thank you for being here. Thank you for caring about your community. Thank you for serving on your board. Um, thank you managers for putting in all the extra hours that you're putting in right now. We, we appreciate you. Um, and just know that continue to watch um, you know, our, our Facebook page because we're putting information out there whenever it comes out. Um, we're working overtime. I can assure you to make sure that you're aware of all these changing circumstances and so that you can continue to make good decisions. So 
everybody, just in closing, be safe, be healthy, um, and know that as things change, we're going to continue to get on Facebook Live and talk about it with you. Make sure you're looking at our cheat sheet pages and our, our live feeds of the Facebook um, because anytime there's new information, we're getting it out there as fast as we can to keep you informed. So everybody have a great rest of the week and a good weekend and enjoy some of the new freedoms that we're going to be having here because of the stay home order being lifted and be careful, wash your hands, um, and enjoy your amenities. If you are reopening them this weekend with, you know, the, a lot of the restrictions that we talked about today. So take care, everybody, until I see you again. Can't wait to see everybody in person in the future. But for now, it's great to see everybody on Facebook Live. So take care. See you soon. Bye.